Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I mean, I know so far, I think I'm seeing uh, Jim Bischoff and Dave Parker on the call both worked on this. Craig Stevenson actually worked with uh, the general contractor. I think Rob Hoskin did the blower door test. So there were a lot of people in the community who actually um, had different roles in different parts of it. So by any means, if anybody has other comments or other insights, I will share my perspective. But always glad to hear kind of how other people viewed it. And uh, I think those of you who know me, I often tend to fixate on maybe what went wrong or how we could do it better next time. So the project as a whole was done as a collaboration between, uh, I'll call my previous predecessor firm, NK Architects. I will say I finally did recover from our architecture and I'm now purely over to doing just passive house consulting and uh, development. Um, but it was done in partnership with Thoughtful Balance, who is another leader in Western Pennsylvania in the Passive House uh, high performance building space. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, it's similar to the Carnegie Library system that went all the way across, funded by Andrew Carnegie. But we have a kind of a residual that is just in Pittsburgh, and they run really kind of all the libraries in the city and those kind of in the close in suburbs. Um, over the last probably decade, they've been slowly upgrading uh, facilities as they go, sometimes just doing interior retrofits. Um, but about what, probably almost seven years ago, uh, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh did Hazelwood, um, which is the one down here. Uh, and that was with Thoughtful Balance and was a retrofit that almost looked like a new construction by the time you were done. Um, going for passive house standard, it did not achieve its blower door test. And the next one up behind this was the Carrick branch. And to their credit, even though they didn't quite achieve it the first time, uh, they were game for trying to uh, take another stab at passive house at uh, Carrick. And Carrick is this one down here, located, you know, kind of in the south hills of the city, south of the city proper. Um, it was an existing branch. It was uh, one lot in from the corner. Um, it really was just kind of a retail shell that was buried into a hillside, uh, you know, had some beautiful kind of glass uh, block kind of front entry. What you see here is the only windows kind of coming into the space. Other than that, it was, you know, three block walls with no skylights, um, a pretty drab space. So really kind of the first idea was that's the property they own, expand up. So at a kind of a feasibility study level, they looked at kind of putting on a second story, kind of stepping it back, moving to kind of like, I'll call it a floor and a half of programming, but doing it as kind of a retrofit with an addition. And the project started moving forward like this, but at some point, like a lot of projects, there was a rethink and you can see here, this was uh, the existing building and they were able to actually acquire the lot to the south. And so that kind of doubled the land available. It also led it from moving from uh, what was planned as a rehab to new construction. And not normally to share kind of internal emails, but there was this crazy schedule that came out kind of unbelievable, meaning, you know, start in April, October of 2016 and be done by April of 2018, you know, 18 months for everything, including, you know, zoning application, design development, construction documents, bidding, procurement, and there. But in all honesty, um, you know, it, it, there were delays, but it was mostly on kind of the design value engineering side. And the project actually opened in October 2018. So it really was kind of two years from, I'll call kind of adding that lot to when the doors opened. And, you know, that might sound like a long time, but for any of you know, to get through high performance design, entitlement, contractor procurement, city review and built, um, it was an incredibly um, aggressive construction schedule. So when the, like, the site got added, um, one of the big issues was they also kind of added some more programming. 
Um, and with that, even on the new site, it needed about a story and a half of space to fit everything that they were looking at. Um, there was some debate because of you know, ADA and circulation, do we actually incorporate an elevator? And pretty early on, the idea came to actually you know, kind of ramp or create a series of spaces uh, circling up through the site to get you to a kind of partial second level and to still kind of have a little bit of kind of ground level public space. So it wasn't built out property line to property line to property line that we could pick up some landscaping. And finally, kind of sticking with, I'll call it the passive or low energy theme, bypass the elevator. You know, take the money that would be spent traditionally on an elevator, put it into the ramps and put it into the flow of the space. Um, partly the program changed was around card catalogs, card racks, reading rooms. Um, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh actually uses a central warehouse and they move books around. That said, they're not getting rid of books altogether. And one of the things we did question was, was there the potential that the number of volumes that they had in the past would that come back? An average library branch had about 12,000 books at the time and they were looking at peeling that back to six uh, because they shuttle books around all the time. They have a transportation network to actually deliver books and materials to anybody at any branch anytime on request. So, you know, part of it was accepting where they are in current operations, but encouraging them to have kind of the flexibility to be able to accommodate more books if that came back in the program in, you know, 50 or 100 years. Just because we do something this way today doesn't mean it's going to stick. Also, really kind of key to that is the children's library portion. Uh, if there's any part of a library that has not gone down, it is uh, early uh, childhood books, reading rooms, the ability to get kids books. But the other thing that came up, um, particularly because of the neighborhood that it's in, it really was more of a, a much more modern program than kind of a traditional library. It serves as a community center. It serves as a place for teen after school programs and for uh, job seekers to come in and use computers who might have, have access to computers or internets in other places. It really is about community support and digital access. And that has to do with uh, the demographics of the computer, uh, the community that it's in. It really did need to service as a community center in addition to a library. And with that, that led to, I'll call it fronting a lot more of those community spaces, getting the children's area to be right up front and center, the meeting room kind of teen room after school program to be front and center and really like the periodical lounge, computer lounge to be kind of on the first floor. And then the stacks became something that actually moved, you know, up top. Um, there also was a community room that went up top. So kind of coming through, you come into the foyer, the ability to go into the children's area directly, the teen area directly, and then the ramp system that kind of circulates around the space we put all of the back of house storage room program space on the ground floor, mechanical on the ground floor, and then created an adult stack that overlooks the second floor. So one of the gestures that we originally had was that kind of two stories on the north side, one story on the south side. And we really maintain that to be able to get kind of clear stories in. Um, you know, it is Pittsburgh, nobody pays attention to north here. North is actually kind of left in these diagrams. Uh, shading and light uh, very early on um, were of consideration and part of the design. I mean, granted, I think this was actually from when we were doing the PHPP model, but they're on the adding space. Uh, there's uh, you know narrow streets. There's a bank right across the way. So um, one of the things we were really concerned about was uh, both getting solar heat in the winter and really trying to uh, protect against solar exposure in the summer. Um, our summers are perpetually getting hotter and wetter. So we wanted to make sure we didn't have tons of unintentional gains or create uh, large heating demands. So in schematic design, um, we really did kind of land on that mass north and then we're playing with how to kind of create that uh, kind of teen center room front and center. So we went through kind of several iterations of kind of massing the material in order to figure that out. And then ultimately, to kind of give you an idea, the front courtyard definitely did grow. Um, we kind of cantilevered the second floor meeting room out over the courtyard. 
And then I think it's just always really helpful to kind of see um, where the line was, uh, where our control line for air sealing and insulation is. Um, I will disclose one of our, I'll call it early mistakes, was um, not necessarily having the right staff or the right oversight when drawings were going out. And a big issue with the project was even though we defined it, they were printed in black and white for bid set. And so we had to issue an addendum for color for air sealing envelope. And it goes, you know, very simple mistake, but definitely created issues with the general all the way through. And even though you might have a firm policy that you draw the line and you make the line in color, really making sure that that happens, that people know where the control envelope is. In my mind, it's, it's a perpetual battle, even with uh, the teams that really know what they're doing. Um, materiality, brick still dominates uh, in Pittsburgh. It's something I really hope to move away from, but uh, in a neighborhood where it might get a little bit more wear and tear on the outside, uh, hard surface ground floor was uh, really a consideration. And then we actually went to a kind of more of a panel siding up high and around back. Uh, from the PHPP, um, just really kind of documenting the spaces and kind of giving you an idea of how it was. I think it's always good to look at what we consider a treated floor area and how you analyze it. Uh, we finally got to a passing model. Um, I will say Jim and I, uh, Jim Bischoff on the call, um, worked a lot on certification with PHA. And one of the areas that really became just painful was dealing with uh, the vestibule and getting somebody on the certification side to actually help us work through the vestibule issues. Um, another issue came on procurement. Uh, it went out for bid um, and we did not get direct review because there was an owner's rep in between us and the general contractors. And really they made a selection of a general contractor with contractor assumptions that didn't necessarily align with what was designed. And so that became kind of a battle through CA. There were certain substitutions that were made that were just forced upon us and that we had to either remodel or rework around. And I think post this experience, I focused a lot more time on just procurement because if you can't make sure that the contractor knows what they're doing, you know, if you don't have it a uh, real solid general conditions to kind of really make sure that the contractor has the training and support and the knowledge that they need, it becomes really difficult to uh, pull these projects off as I think anybody who worked on this project would attest. Uh, but to the general's credit who was selected, uh, Macero, um, they did hire uh, Craig Stevenson to help out on the QA, QC side. And I think that was uh, really key to kind of point off the project. So I think the most difficult early part of this, oh, I guess I should say, in the beginning of construction, completely unrelated to Passive House, uh, beneath the existing building, contractor goes out and digs, starts excavation, and hits a gigantic, I'll call it glacial boulder. And that destroyed the early schedule. So um, very early on, there were large amounts of, I'll call it, uh, tentative change orders and construction delays and threats of penalties against the general contractor and blaming the architect for not knowing there was a boulder under an existing retail building. Um, that crunched the entire schedule and to the contractor's credit, they had enough staff to be able to staff up for it, but that meant just throwing bodies and overlapping subs in a way that might not have made sense. So that made the tail end of construction quite difficult. Um, the subsurface itself, um, we have, you know, radon, groundwater, a whole bunch of things to deal with here. Um, we use kind of a stego system, kind of, you know, over insulation, as you can see. And a lot of the challenge was really just kind of how to, um, yeah, deal with, you know, when we went to the ramps, we went away from having what I'll call a nice flat slab floor. Um, and the initial design, you know, if we would have just come in, had one story with an elevator, four walls, really easy to deal with air sealing and insulation. When you have four or five different levels that are stepping up and a ramp that for a while is kind of built up dirt on insulation, then moving over to, you know, floating over spaces, there was just a lot more complexity through those design decisions. So, you know, just to give you kind of an idea, um, hit some of these to get it. The next big issue was we were working to use kind of those existing walls as more or less retaining walls. 
and then to build the new structure in front of it. And then um, I'll say uh, packing in insulation in between. Um, there was a value in engineering decision that I think ended up really having massive ramifications, which was we had proposed cast in place concrete walls, you know, put up waterproofing, put up insulation, cast, blindside, water sealing, air sealing, but that tends to work really well. Um, there was a value engineering to move to uh, basically uh, CMU block, um, Ivany block walls. And that just led to this whole other slew of construction details. And it would have been a lot easier if we, um, I think, had just cast it in. But that was something that was really forced upon us by uh, the owner's rep. Um, then there started compounding contractor, I'll call it, uh, slight errors. And one of them was that they started not having, say, beam pockets where they needed to be. So then also we have a hole in the wall, which we need to patch, and a new hole we have to make to insert steel. Uh, it just became um, a much more uh, difficult situation than I think we would have hoped. And my take, my guess is that if we would have stuck to what I'll call the true blindside insulation of that wall, uh, it would have saved us and the contractor just an immense amount of uh, uh, headache and heartache while we were working on it. Uh, thermal breaks, obviously key. And here we went with a a local structural engineer um, who really did not want to do it. He was brought into this kicking and screaming. Um, we were literally to like building permit submittal fighting to get breaks in steel on a, well, you know, obviously a very conductive structure. And the first pass was they just threw pressure treated wood in. And my take is <laughs> great. You're building a hundred or 200 year structure and you're holding up the stuff that's cannily ran off the face with a 20 year material. Like how does that work? So we had to work hard both with the structural engineer, the owner's rep and the general contractor just to get to like basic thermal break material. Um, you can see kind of um, this first one here, that is the post. We have a decorative post in the front and I needed to kind of hold up the um, upstairs meeting room. You can see kind of like right in here where that location is. So an exterior post needing to break that to the interior side. Um, we used ideal wall construction, which I would always encourage everybody to do. So the whole steel structure was wrapped, but then we needed to get up to the parapet. So focusing on how to really break for that high wall to parapet transition. Um, that said, I mean, uh, as much as it was difficult on kind of the design and getting consultants on board for it, it all turned out okay. I mean, everything that needed to be done in order to, you know, meet the energy model to really deal with those side values was able to be addressed. Um, things that went well on the project, I would say, would be kind of the ideal wall and the uh, air ceiling on the inside. Um, you know, from my recollection, and I could be wrong, it was not a terribly hard one to actually hit the air numbers. Um, but there was kind of a good consistent uh, what structures on the warm side, what structures on the cold side. So by the time we were, you know, at that level of construction, it was in. Um, the only area that I would kind of caveat on that was the grade transitions um, with the Ivany wall, with some of the excavation, with the shifting of grade levels around the building. Um, I think we, as a collective team, probably could have paid more attention to how kind of like the, the siding terminated. But with the variations of what was happening at the bottom, and even just the variations in grade line during construction, it would have been really hard to kind of hit that up front. Uh, on the consultant sides that worked out well, um, I should really charge Galen Stengel a uh, sales pitch because uh, I, I promote his work everywhere. Uh, we've done work with uh, Galen around the country. And I would say, you know, other than maybe just some, you know, light to mechanical issues, I think the system actually works really well for the space. Um, you know, there were, uh, it was a VRF system with uh, zoned ERVs. Um, I think, uh, you know, just the blending of what I'll call the fresh air supply with a delivery system and a commercial construction, it makes sense. It's a good way to go. It's a reliable way to do it. There are plenty of cases where I would argue against doing it this way, but for a library, for a compact footprint, um, even just the amount of refrigerant that you need, um, 
not a huge deal in my mind. Like I think uh, overall the system's working quite well, it was really a good and efficient design and a great way to solve for it. Then uh, moving on. So it, it got completed and I think it always is helpful to kind of see how everything works out, how the spaces are occupied and how they're perceived. Um, I think you can tell we definitely use kind of a dark tinted glass plus brisoles to really control gain. Um, you know, if you look at those windows, you can just tell they're not letting a lot of, uh, or a controlled amount of light through. Uh, the brisoles were very early on kind of just modeled for effect. And I mean, if you look at this, it's facing Southwest and you can kind of see, you know, summertime hitting two thirds of the glazing, you know, South side hitting all the glazing. Um, you know, if things that went well, I do think kind of placing and the locating of those very early in schematic design uh, worked out. Um, one thing that we fretted over um, was mechanical and electrical with the speed that the general contractor was moving. They were just slapping stuff on top of each other. And we ended up in a lot of fights of just trying to decide where it mattered and where it didn't. But I mean, some of my favorite uh, issues we had were like line sets run on the outside of drywall. Just like, how the hell do you do that? I mean, as a contractor, how can you have respect for your quality control if you've got the line set coming down the face of what's a finished wall? Um, in the end, mechanical kind of, even though it's all exposed, all the systems are exposed, they do disappear, you know, with the white walls, like colored floor, mid-tone gray ceiling. Um, the ducts, I think, were uh, really well kind of placed and designed. You don't really see it. I mean, even when you're in the space, I don't think you perceive the exposed mechanical to the way that we do. I mean, an architect or design professional moving in, there's definitely things I wish that the general would have uh, cleaned up. So uh, this is just the front, giving you a kind of an idea of how it works. You know, the main check-in desk, you can see the periodical stacks behind, right behind the deck desk is where that ramp starts to wind up through the space. There's a really a nice feeling double volume space where the periodicals are. And then you can kind of see that kind of, I'll call it the team center, which is to the right side of the image, one of the meeting rooms uh, to the left. Uh, once again, this is that kind of uh, corner team center. So there's a, I'll call it a power bar, but you know, you can bring in your own equipment and charge it or use the libraries. Um, I think the lighting turned out quite well. We eventually did get all the light fixtures to work around all the mechanical. Um, it turned into a, a great space. Uh, the children's space um, is used. I don't know if they ever really use the door to kind of come in and outside, but um, turned out to be a really nice intimate space kind of tucked below. Uh, periodical stack, um, once again, this is kind of like, I think where you can see it all. We have the stair here that's like the bypass to get up to the stacks. And then this area is wrapped on all the sides by um, the ramp going up front. And then our work up high. And I think this kind of gives you an idea of, I guess, just how much stuff is kind of up above. But I think the light fixtures do a lot to kind of, uh, you know, get your mind off of the stuff that us architects tend to see up above. Now this is moving kind of further up the ramp, looking down through the space where we're kind of getting the clear stories into the main reading or the main periodical space. Um, there's the kind of computer nooks uh, kind of on either side of there. Um, we fretted a lot over this little notch here, which I'll call a Revit issue, you know, and then the, the end it just uh, turns into a place for art. And they do still have stacks. So this is the, um, looking through kind of the second floor. They ran lower shelves kind of around the edge, but then have a seating area and the ability that's designed to be able to take the larger loads. So if and when uh, books come back in favor, there really is the ability to kind of add them back in if it sways um, the other way. So, you know, with that, um, I think I'll, kind of kick it over for questions or even other comments from those on the team. Um, I think, you know, the discussion of, like I said, the what went right and what went wrong, to me, that's actually the more kind of interesting part of uh, the Passive House stories, because, uh, 
you know, we're all trying to figure out similar things. We're all trying to figure out better ways to do it. Uh, one of the best ways we do that is through events like this and hearing, you know, uh, what others are kind of going through uh, for it. So uh, with right. that, I think I'll head it back to you, Ken, or uh, Jim, yeah. if you're moderating. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, terrific, it's a beautiful project. Thank uh, you. So uh, if, if folks want to type questions into the chat, uh, happy to, to pull them out. I certainly have a couple of questions to, to kick off with and uh, be nice to have a, a discussion. So one thing I was thinking about was that, you know, this is not a uh, cube by any stretch of the imagination. It's quite a bit of articulation to the volumes. Uh, what was the issue? Like, what was the push and pull working with the PHPP on that? And did it really drive? <laughs> Did it make you step back and reconsider? Yeah, that? no, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, so uh, you know, I've been doing this stuff. God, it's like eleven years now, right? The very first thing we did was just like the boxiest house you could imagine. So simple, simple modeling. And I think I've really waffled between the balance between really trying to do architecture, good architecture design, or letting the program drive, versus simplification. And, you know, I can see sides from both. Um, I will say the the lead designer on this pretty early on is a phenomenal designer, but he is very into kind of like modulation and massing. And so, um, you know, Steve Fisher, who was actually in our Seattle office, did kind of a lot of those initial sketches. And what it was, was this kind of program and trying to figure out how to create something kind of architecturally interesting and how, you know, like why, in the beginning, we were trying to kind of like say, increase the court space outside the children's and trying to get the meeting room up above. So what do architects do? You push out the second floor, you pull back the first and you get both. You know, I think in retrospect, I think that's a really good call. Like I've, in my own work, I think really simplified to move back to larger, more simple gestures. It's not, it's, I'm not trying to eliminate like the architecture of it. But I think for me personally, I've tried to really come back to um, simpler solutions. Um, from the model side too, I think I showed um, from a process standpoint, it's something we've been debating for years. Are you better documenting in you know, Bluebeam PDFs or Revit or AutoCAD or how do you do it? And I think this project in particular was a pretty good example of how to do the documentation of Revit. Um, it does require, you know, brain damage tracking everything that you're doing in Revit and transferring it over to AutoCAD. For this one, I think it was the right decision. Um, other simpler jobs, we've been using Design PH a lot and having good results with the export. But this one, there were just too many unique situations. I think it had to go in, I hate to say manually, but I don't know. My take was it had to go in manually. There was no other way to track it all. Yeah. Um, and the ground plane too, like we added a lot of complexity off, I mean, what I think was a really good design gesture. Um, I'm not sure what we would have done to simplify it. I mean, I think in the end, the, the ramp system and the tiered uh, solution was the right way to go about it. It just created a lot more um, difficulty in uh, ground plane air seal. Yeah. Vapor berry seal. Great. Um to, to, to sort of follow up on that, the, the glazing as well. I mean, this isn't, uh, you know, little windows, little windows <laughs> architecture. Um, and what you of, miss is the two walls that have no windows. Right. So right. like, you know, if you look at it, that's a great question again, too. Like this was very intentional placement of glazing, right? Um, so the spaces that really could use the light the children's room, the teen center, the lobby, the meeting room, this is the facade, those all face. So this is where most of the glass was. This is facing west. So, you know, the gesture of stepping back that lower floor, I mean, I kind of knock it as for creating undue detailing, but that created shading for the children's area. There are buildings right across the street, like this is in a really dense urban neighborhood. So we actually get west shading from uh, neighboring structures. Mm -hmm. That north wall, like, you know, doesn't really have windows. The east wall really doesn't have windows and the south wall is more minimal. So I think what you see is kind of like, you know, not being scared to use glass where it has an impact, meaning a visual connection to the neighborhood and the right-of-way, 
but then immediately turning to some uh, you know portion of that same space that doesn't need it and no windows you know solid brick wall like just a logo and you know the logo from the very beginning kind of was planned to be something you know not just like a little sign hanging off the <laughs> building using the blank wall for it yeah um, and I, i'll say sketchup very early on the last thing i'll say on that was we were really paying attention to like i mean i hate to say the sketchup tool where you're just moving the sun back and forth for brisole planning forget like design ph or any of the other things just looking at how the light is behaving and relevant in, in relation to the windows at various times of year that led to like the vertical windows, the brisolets, like the kind of you know design for orientation. It's not perfect, but it doesn't overheat. It's not destroying the, the model. Right. Terrific. Yeah, it sounds like you know the big bold moves and really concentrating on where the value is. Mm -hmm. um, it's the right move. Uh, we have a question here from Frank Reynolds. Um, what was the CM selection method? Was it lump sum bid? uh or construct you know cm yeah no so um it was so it was a uh, lump sum and they went to four general contractors um and like i said they received the bids and we got told who the general was after receiving after they received the bids and the owner basically made a decision i think the challenge here actually was on the owner's website Meaning Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh does not have an internal, you know, construction department. So they outsource that. And that's where you can start to get some, um, you know, differences in the priority. Meaning the head of the library, the, the library board is in favor of Passive House. The owner's rep who was hired didn't necessarily care about that. And that really led to, I think, a lot of the you know, tension because you have kind of an ownership group that's trying to really head one way and head the right way. And then the person who they hire isn't necessarily in line with it and trying to get to the lowest cost. And so, you know, some of the changes that happened, um, you know, just big value engineering things, right? Like we're not gonna use fiberglass windows, we're gonna use Alpen windows. You know, Alpen has certified passive house windows. Great, yeah, Alpen probably is acceptable. Okay, but the series that they picked wasn't, and we mm -hmm. didn't have, you know, control over that. So then next thing you know, it comes back to the design team to take, you know, an owner and contractor decision and try to make sure that it just didn't destroy the model overall. And, you know, in retrospect, we had a lot of difficulties with that, I'll call it just substitutions that, um, you know, we were not necessarily party to the decision. We were told what the decision was made and then had to try to solve for the ramifications of that. And how, in my mind, that's not the way to do it. Right. I mean, how are they to doing that? They needed to maintain the spec, no? Uh, uh, well, no, see, this is where the owner's rep basically was- This overrules the specification. Yeah, like essentially, exactly. Like the contractor bid it with these, uh, substitutions and clarifications and assumptions on the specification so therefore huck the spec out the window and go with it you know one of the internal mistakes that we made too um, was on window specification meaning for code compliance building permit um, we needed to leave in what i'll call the code values to get through well, anybody working in Passive House knows that like U values of windows and U values of frames, there's so much variation, just even within the same manufacturer, you're getting a range mm -hmm. when you actually model the, the window. So it's very hard to basically say like that window has this U value because we all know that varies by the proportion and the size of the volume or whatever. I actually think focusing on specification of like the series and the glass expectation and leave the performance criteria to the model is almost a better way to do it because then you don't have the contractor saying like well you said i could get away with this u value <laughs> well, right you, yeah um so what was the contractor's attitude generally i mean did they so did, were they yeah so the contractor actually to their credit um, they didn't have internal passive house training or knowledge, but they dove in, they went outside, they hired somebody, you know, to essentially help them through it, which I think was the right move to do. Um, they did 
you know, struggle. But I think the biggest struggle for them was actually hitting the boulder. Like when they hit that boulder, that put them under immense um, financial and time constraints. And they're really, the other issue too, was it was done with zero contingency. Mm. You know, on the development side, would I ever sign a general contract with a general contractor without a soft cost or hard cost contingency? Like, no, like that is, and, and where, where are you going to blow your contingency? It's not passive house. You're going to blow it in earthwork. You're going to blow it on shoring. You're going to blow it on footings, uh, bad soil. It's the same as any other construction. Right. Project. It's a it's a classic argument that it's passive house isn't really driving the ultimate yeah. cost of the project. There are other externalities that are much yep. bigger impact. But that and said, they, often- Well, they also, not, the owner put liquidated damages in the contract. So like if Macero, despite that delay, didn't deliver on time, they were gonna potentially suffer financial consequences. And so, so when I say like, they normally would have scheduled things like you bring in the light gauge, then you bring in the you know fire, and then you bring in the plumber, and then you bring in the electrician, and you kind of layer these systems on top that go behind the walls in order to not blow the schedule. They brought in everybody simultaneously and then that led to the issue of like you have plumbing going in concurrent to mechanical going current to electrical and so then the next thing you know um we're just playing catch up like why is the wire outside the wall why is the condensate outside the wall because they're right. drywalling before the systems are behind well the good news with the uh ideal wall was they could be doing that the air barriers on the outside they weren't going to puncture the air barrier but then they were tripping over themselves. And then we actually started getting change orders, which were like, you know, well, so the way that it would start would be like, okay, the line sets up a wall, you got to cover it. Okay, architect, draw me how to cover a line set. Great, two channels, three pieces of drywall covered in. And then the contractor goes, okay, well, here's the change order for covering the line set. Like, <laughs> I thought the line set was supposed to be in yeah. the wall like that's that's construction right yeah um, it is but that's you know i would say like back to the systems overlap that was probably the only thing that really went wrong from i'll say a passive house side the things that really blew the time and budget were just general construction right interesting so how did the owner um i mean it, it, it's a testament to that the library system wanted to keep passive house in it wasn't there um, well, so, out? I think it was, I'll actually give a lot of credit to like uh, Laurel Nettleton and Thoughtful Balance and kind of uh -huh. the rest of the team. Like we all just did whatever we needed to do to get it in. Like, I think Craig wanted it certified. Jim wanted it certified. Dave wanted it certified. I wanted it certified. We were just going to do whatever it took to get it done. And, you know, we got the blower door. So, you know, that took, I'm not saying that was easy, but they had the right people, the right staff and the right QAQC to make sure that they got that done. So what else would we really mess up? Well, the thermal brakes. Well, we did get those all designed and in. Mechanical, mechanical commissioning. Uh, working with Galen, um, you know. <laughs> so it's really having that committed team that's working. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it was everybody else wanting to do it. And the general, to their credit, I think they want, I mean, they see this as the way that it was going. They wanted to be able to get through it and, you know, put the plaque on the wall the same way as everybody else did. So I think you're right. The the team around uh, wanted to hit that goal. Yeah. Terrific. And so going back to the sequencing and everything, what, um, I mean, in terms of the air barrier, you hit the number, but was there any particular issues in the sequencing with all those things happening with, you know, Cuts no, so with I hate to say with the anybody. ideal wall, like you've got the steel shell and all the mechanical has to go in those service chaseways, but the sheathing is already in, right? The drywall and the air barrier are on the back side. So mm -hmm. other than a limited number of penetrations, which like any passive house project, there's a not a lot of penetrations, right? I mean it's you know, a couple ERV intakes and exhausts, you know, a couple light fixtures, but even like the down lights, those were like outside of the envelope beyond. So all we had was like right. wire seals to membrane. Were you able um, to do a test before you covered the air barrier? 
You know, actually, I don't think they did. Jim would probably remember more than I would, but I That's actually don't my know. Recollection. They, yeah. If they did, it was without us being part of it. Yeah. Or possible because of who they had on as a sort of second or third party, maybe QAQC folks who really knew that that was important to do, they may have done it. Yeah. And that may be the reason why it, it ultimately made them the agree. Is Craig on? I don't see him. Yeah. yeah, I was going to uh, say, is Rob on? I mean, Rob would be the one who would know as he was the, the oh, one yeah. who did the test. Oh, he's the, he's the one. Yeah. Um, so another question um, related to, you, you know, you described the difficulty of hitting the, the pH metrics. Um, but looking at the PHPP, you are down at 3.9. And and your your primary yeah. energy was down at thirty four. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it feels like you breezed in. <laughs> well, so I will say, like, um, we typically stack the PHPP to begin with. I'll be the first one to say that. Like, if Be real I think plenty of other, we're not the first person to say this. If you're coming out of schematic design and you got one percent, you're kind of screwed. Right? You're gonna get hit. Our big issues were around windows and that vestibule. And I mean, really, I hate to say the vestibule and the vestibule, like that space, it's just hard. I mean, anybody who's doing commercial passive house, we just don't have great thermally broken storefront right now. And so a good way around it is creating these ambiguous spaces where you might use one passive house layer, or one the best you can get, let's say, uh, thermally broken and one standard. You now have multiple frames, four panes of glass, two frames, and the air in between as your gasket. And that's the issue. It's like getting to good modeling standards, you know, at PHI or with PHA, whoever it is, to accept it, or really just counting that extra layer. But if you only count that one external layer, what happens is you're never going to meet like the comfort criteria on the inside of that, you know, Conier thermally broken storefront. In my mind, that's fine, but I think we just need a much more standardized approach. I'll just say particularly on vestibules because any large commercial project, you know, a school, community center, large multifamily, like there's a reason why we did vestibules in houses in the 1800s, right? Two doors and that interstitial yep. space actually acts as insulation, right? Anybody who's lived in a brownstone or anybody who's like pre-war New York, uh, there was a reason they did it. And not having a good way to either get the material or model, it's a, I would say it's not a great place that we're in. And it's, a, it's something that as Passive House moves into commercial, I think we just need to have a much, much more straightforward way to, to deal with it. Um, here's a question, uh, speaking of modeling, um, I think you know the answer to this, but I'll let you speak to it. Uh, of course. The, so what load calculation software did the engineer use? Doing houses, uh, we use a simple manual yeah. spreadsheet. A commercial building would be a little more challenging. So I, I want to say that I think Galen uses um, JTrace, but I'm not positive. You know, I mean, I hate to say like, maybe that's one of the reasons why I go to Galen, so I don't have to worry about asking. Um, <laughs> So we've worked with a whole series of other mechanical engineers, uh, several who we've kind of like trained up on projects recently. And, uh, you know, some of them who kind of naturally get it, particularly, you, you know, following ASHRAE can get within about, I'll call it 20%, 25% of air volumes of what, you know, we would from a passive house. And we on the passive house side are always, low. <laughs> we're always below whatever. They are. So normally I find the issue doesn't really come up unless there's a big divergence in where we think the air supply should be and where the engineer thinks it should be. Um, but one of the reasons why I go back to, you know, Stengel again and again, or, you know, one of the other ones I've had a lot of luck with is uh, McGran out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, you get the right engineer. It, you don't even have to ask those questions. You don't even pay attention to what they're doing because really they actually know what we're doing on PHPP. We agree like uh, for say ventilation rates. Um, right now we're working on a school retrofit. So we have occupancy and ventilation rates established actually pretty early and then just verifying with the mechanical engineer that 
we're within you know the realm of what you know mm -hmm. we're not too far off on the numbers from them so you're not fighting with them through yeah this well i mean like anything else and the too, sizing like, of the equipment right? right so we're always i mean i like we're always under our assumptions through probably dd and then I feel like it's DD and first certification is when we actually, we lose kind of our drive of, you know, our passive house approach to what we view ventilation and then start layering in the engineers and just making sure we didn't break something. Right. Um, I will say something else that we've really started doing is actually doing our own internal air change calculations on volume. And I find that's actually one of the best checks. So if you're in residential, is it more than you know an air change every three hours in the mechanical? If you're moving over to more commercial or high density, is it more than one air change per hour? And just looking at some of those kind of like real high level triggers, like are we seeing way more ventilation than we would anticipate? Mm -hmm. And like on the commercial side, you know, if it's every hour and a half, you can pretty much get there. But if you start seeing more ventilation per hour than you have volume my general experience is that just kind of destroys your phpp model no matter what you do on an erv and so just having those conversations with a good mechanical engineer and coming to what you know we on the phpp side and what the engineer feel comfortable with right terrific could you um speaking of the mechanical systems expand a little bit more on the description of the system that was installed here? yeah so one thing we've done actually a fair amount with Galen is blending um, the ERV system with a VRF system. And so with the variable refrigerant cooling system, you know, there's, I was going to say, there's some pros and cons to it. And I've actually generally been moving away from them, particularly in multifamily, but on a small, and that's just because of the amount of um, refrigerant used. Like I just think these gigantic commercial buildings if you put the refrigerants that you need and the you know the global warming capacity and the danger and everything else that comes with them, we need to use them really sparingly. But when you come to like a small footprint and a really small efficient system, I have a little bit less concern about the volume of refrigerant because it starts becoming more in line with what you'd have if you just use straight air source heat pumps. But when you're using a VRF system, most of the cassettes, the minimum airspeed that has to run through that cassette to pick up the energy, 275 CFM, you know, like more CFM than we would ever need. <laughs> so we did a whole series of projects with Galen where we were using VRFs in tandem with the ERV. The ERV is just circulating the air, but the VRF has an ability to one, pick up some of that fresh air and send it through the vents, but then also do makeup air on that same space. So you could be running a hundred CFM background, you know, call fresh air supply. The ERV just keeps running, but the heating or cooling kicks in and that 175 to get up to that full volume comes in from the interior air, blends through the duct system and distribute it out. And I think for, you know, commercial applications or institutional applications, Small systems like that, you know, if you're not having, if you take the refrigeration issue aside, what that enables this to do is really have kind of true zones for delivery. Like if the meeting room's not being occupied, you can just shut the whole system down and the team center is going full bore and it's churning away with supplier and air conditioned air, you know, by need. And you can be in heating and cooling simultaneously. So if you need to move air from one side or energy from one side to the other, you know, in theory, the system should be able to handle it. Um, but the, the place of VRF in the world, you know, I think for this one, it was a, a great solution. I think it worked really well because of the footprint of the building and the scale and the needs. Like I said, what I worry about is large multifamily. Like I, as much as we've done a whole series of projects with it, um, I'm moving back towards one-to-one -to -one air source just because of simplicity and refrigerant, uh, controlling the amount of refrigerant out in the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how about issues of comfort? Um, any any feedback or sense? And, and I'm wondering sure. as well about the acoustics and the, you know, we're talking about a library, quiet space to begin yeah. with, passive house. The mechanical systems, the street, I don't know. 
Yeah. Uh, any feedback on that? So uh, maybe I'll put it through several. So, you know, like any designer, I'm rarely ever in like projects I work on, right? Like the thing you go to the ribbon cutting and you're there. Uh, but I went pre-COVID um, about a year after it was occupied in the summer just to see, you know, how's it being used? You know, are people, you know, is it packed with people? Are they occupying it? How does it feel? And, you know, it, it, my only thing is I could, I'd just say it was comfortable, right? I mean, like the lighting seemed good. The air temperature seemed good. There seemed no humidity issue. The humidity issue was on the outside because it was like summer. It was not on the inside. So the my perception was it was fine. And then uh, Jim was saying that he had actually heard uh, some more feedback uh, from Laura about <coughs> like comfort ranges and that they were starting to play with like a much broader uh, set temperature. But that's good to hear. I mean, like if the humidity is in control and it can creep up to 77 or 78 without people griping about it, it's doing what it should. Yeah. And Jim, I don't know if you had more you want to say on that, but. No, uh, it's just something I heard um, on the Accelerator podcast. And I do, there's, it's hard to get a total sense of the space from pictures, but there's a huge volume in this space, more so than just story, one story on the right, two stories on the left. That inter, you know, in between the two, there's a really, basically a two-story volume that I think, I think it's likely that there's some stratification going on that's providing a lot of extra comfort. Um, and there's a, there's a there's not a, there's a lot of hard surfaces, but the entire roof on that two story is acoustical deck, which unrelated to Pascal's is a big challenge in terms of the roof deck being acoustical and sequencing and it being you know potentially exposed to bad weather, but then it being exposed to the interior and any little change leaves a hole in the exposed deck. But that's other things um, in terms of comfort, you know, acoustical comfort. Um, it, it, my experience of being there a couple of times is that it feels a lot more like a community center than it does a library because you have this sort of activation. So it's not meant to be 100% silent and you can't talk because there are kids in there, there's a teen center, but they have the ability to close those spaces off and you can sit in the corner and be quiet and have the, um, the ability to read a book or use a computer. Um, I've heard some anecdotal experience that they've had to add like extra security cameras because they find kids are in the space and they lose track of them because they're they can't hear them right so they you know they're like on the back side hanging out on the ramp which the ramp was not really meant to be a place where people hang out it was meant to be get from the lower level to the upper level in a way um so they're finding that they're you know having to be a little more aware of who's in the space because they can't quite track them which is a good thing i think in terms of using the space maybe as an operator of the space different perspective um yeah that's all i know so far Terrific. Well, it sounds like it's um, outside of the COVID issues, getting good use. Yeah, yeah and I, you know, I think that's something too, because libraries have been shut down here. So, you know, one of the challenges would be like getting actual occupied energy data. I mean, there was some very early on, and I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but their current bills are called 75 to 80% of what they were but when it was one lot one story. Wow. That's now two lot, story and a half. Yeah, and it's fraction. lower than where they started. So, uh, but now that's been, you know, and I'm not sure what all the branches are, but, you know, all the, well, I think the whole system has basically been shut down except for, you know, some lending ability. So I don't think they're fully occupied anywhere. So, is it your sense that Carnegie's a uh, fan? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, my, my sense is they're probably going to go do it again because they've done it before, you know, like they've been behind it, but you have transitions in board and staff over right. time. So um, I know the next one up was a historic renovation on, you know, a, a, a building that would not lend itself to it, meaning a, a two-story brick, small footprint. And, it, you know, I don't think that one's going to, go that way. I mean, it might have some aspects of it, but I don't think it, I don't even think it'd probably be certifiable even under Interfit just right. because of the proportions. Yeah. Well, just one, yeah. one wants to imagine uh, Carnegie making a 21st century push across America with the new 
new round of Passive House libraries. Yeah. Well, so um, I think the, all, the only challenge with Carnegie, though, is th this is like its own like little residual spur. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A thousand yeah, libraries all, everywhere. All different There's now. these, you know, 15 that are here that are now detached of everywhere else. But well, it's a good thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're right at time. This was terrific. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for your input as well, Absolutely. Jim. Absolutely. Um, and everyone for coming today. This will be available online. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at the next NAPHN live event and, and other events going forward. Uh, do check out the conference. We hope to see you all soon. Thanks so much. Have a good day, everybody.